Well, guys, thank you. And Pastor Russ, thank you. Um, man, it's always a joy uh, to come up here and to share the Lord's word with you. Uh, it's always really important to me that whenever I get up here, uh, that it's not about uh, me and that it's about God speaking to all of us. Most often, whenever I speak, I feel like uh, the Lord's convicting me in the midst of the sermon more often than uh, any other time in my life. I'm like, okay, Lord, I hear you. So uh, I just pray that the Lord continues to pour out his grace and his mercy and pour out his spirit on us as we dive into the scriptures this morning. So we're in a current series called Don't Live Stupid. But man, I want to just take a moment and say thank you for being here because on this holy and sacred uh, day, uh, this holiday that is so important, uh, Super Bowl Sunday, come on, you guys are with me, right? You guys are here in church worshiping God. Man, you are anointed and highly favored of God. Man, you're beautiful and wonderful. Yeah, you guys are the real believers, the rest of them. Just kidding. Those of you who are watching online, uh, you are saved as well. Uh, good. But, uh, man, I'm just so glad you guys are here. And how many of you are going to be rooting for Kansas City? Can I just get a good shout out? Oh, come on. You can do this. It's okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Whoa. Easy. Hey. Whoa. Easy. My goodness. Jesus name. How many of you guys are going to be rooting for San Francisco? Wow. A lot of you. A lot of you. Well, I'm just so glad you're here because we're in the midst of a sermon called Don't Live Stupid. And I think this is for you this morning. <laughs> so, man. <laughs> so I got to clap. Good. Okay. I worked hard on that joke, guys. I worked hard on it. So I appreciate you laughing. Okay. Well, this is the second installment. We just jumped into this series on this book of Proverbs, which as Pastor Russ so eloquently titled and, and titled it and just said, this is what we're studying. We're studying how to not live stupidly. So encouraging, isn't it? It's so, I just feel so encouraged. I'm ready to tackle life because we're not going to live stupidly. Amen. So how do we do that? Um, here's the thing. I, I think it's funny to think about uh, stupidity because it just seems like stupidity is coming at us from every direction, all day, every day. I went to dinner with my wife on Friday night. Uh, it was good to get away from the love and the care of our children and how wonderful they are and just how, you know, they listen to everything that we say. Um, it was real hard, but we just, we just bore that cross and we went on a date. And uh, we went and got sushi. And I know that some of you are probably thinking, well, that was stupid, eating, paying that much money to eat raw fish. But listen, it made my wife happy. Okay, now that's wisdom. It doesn't matter. Listen, happy life, happy, oh, wife. happy wife, or happy wife, happy. happy life. Listen, it goes either way. You want life to be good? Oh, my. Mm. Jesus, Selah, let's just rest on that for a moment. Mm. <laughs> While we were sitting there at sushi, we sat at the bar, and uh, there's a table up. We didn't want to sit at a table because it was like 45 minutes to wait. And I said, well, there's a couple chairs right there, and I know we're sitting side by side, and I'm not just sitting across from you where I can gaze into your beautiful blue eyes. I promise you I'll look to the side, and I'll look at those beautiful blue eyes. But it's unfortunate for a person like me who has ADHD that there's a TV right there. So she's sharing, and she's sharing, man, I'm just so passionate about this work that I'm doing. And I'm like, yeah, baby, me too. Uh huh. No, right, yeah, huh? Yeah, and I look up, and there's this commercial. And the commercial, there's this guy, he's half naked, and he's wearing a toga. I'm like, this, what is that? Okay, yeah, yeah, you're with me, right? Yeah, I have a good reason to be distracted. I'm looking at the TV like, what am I watching right now? Why do they have this on? And it's a cologne commercial. And he's like walking in the rain. And listen, admittedly, admittedly, he is yoked. And I'm like, okay, wow, I can have a bro crush on that. You know, wow, that is pretty awesome, right? And so he's walking out there just slow motion, and he's got a bow and an arrow. And I'm like, where's this going? And he like climbs up on this, not on a mountain, 
It's like a pedestal. It's like this thing right here, the stairs into the baptismal tank. You know, and he's like in the rain, and he like shoots this arrow into the sky. <laughs> and, you know, it's like when you shoot an arrow with no shirt on, he's like, <laughs> you know, he's just, he's just letting it all hang out like a brick house, right? <laughs> and here we are, and I'm like, baby, I'm sorry, but look at this. She's like, Dan, pay attention to me. I'm like, I can't. I can't. All my attention is on this Greek god of a man. And I just thought to myself, how stupid is this? How stupid? Think about this with me for a moment. What are they trying to tell us? That if what? If I buy their cologne and I spray this cologne, that I'm going to grow a foot and a half, put on 50 pounds of pure, unadulterated, handsome muscle, and I'm going to be able to shoot arrows in the rain? <laughs> at the end of the commercial, like I look at my wife, I'm like, no, my, my attention's totally on you, baby. And I look back at the TV, just glance. It was just a glance. And I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden he's standing there with this beautiful woman, and, you know, and, and she's got, she's like standing there like Zoolander Blue Steel with a puckered mouth, like, you know, getting, <laughs> and I'm like, what is, what is happening? So, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to get huge and ripped from cologne, and I'm going to have a beautiful woman just making kissy faces all the time. How stupid is that? And yet, somehow, it appeals to some guys on an emotional level. They're like, I need that. I need the rain. And I need a little height. And I need a lot of muscle. Okay? It's just stupid. We're f I mean, listen, just watch TikTok for a little while. You'll, ha you'll see like 16-year-old girls trying to give advice about how to have a good marriage. What? Are you serious right now? We're like celebrating stupidity every day. I have no idea. To be honest with you, I'm still, I'm still just blown away by this commercial. <laughs> I woke up this morning. I'm supposed to be preaching, and I'm thinking about buying cologne, buying cologne and being half naked in a toga in the rain. <laughs> That's all I can think about. It's dumb. Chuck Swindle was talking about stupidity, and he actually says this. He says, a saying I heard years ago. Here it is. All right. No, that's not it. This is actually good stuff. That's not stupid. But what uh, Chuck Swindle says is, I, a saying I heard years ago. It doesn't matter what you do. Just do something, even if it's wrong. Okay, pause. Time out. How many of you know, like... We can be afraid of inactivity. We can be afraid of silence. I remember I didn't get married until I was 30. I was waiting for just gold, and I got it. But my mom was getting kind of worried. You know, I'm here I am, 27, and she's like, I'm not dating anybody. And she's like, my mom's Korean, so she's like, Dania. I'm like, yeah, mom. She's like, go on a date. You got it. So there's this girl. I start going on a date with her. And she's, listen, guys, oh, Father in heaven, she is bat poo poo crazy, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's how the saying goes. And uh, my mom's like, okay, listen, listen, is she a Christian? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I met her at church and she's on some leadership team. I don't know. Yeah, she's a Christian. And she's like, then marry her. I'm like, what? It was probably the worst advice I'd ever heard. And I didn't know at the time when I was taking her on this date that she was, like, really, I'm not trying to, like, gaslight anybody here. I mean, she was, she was, like, wanting to fight, and that was, like, some kind of expression of love. I just can't, can't do that. I can't do that, you know? And so I'm like, Mom, no, I can't do this. Listen, don't do something because you're afraid of inactivity, I wasn't dating. I wasn't. My mom's like, oh, my God, I'm not going to have grandkids. Just marry a girl. That's the worst advice you can get. Young people, any young people, and like, listen, don't do that, all right? So, so Chuck Swindoll continues, and he's like, the, the, the saying, uh, he's like, it's the most stupid counsel I've ever heard. That's what he says. He's like, that is so stupid. Part of the reason I love this uh, series is because I can be on stage and just say stupid a lot. That's stupid. You know, and, and he's, he's like, this is Chuck Swindoll, right? He's like, that's stupid. And he says, never do what's wrong. 
Do nothing until it's right. Then do it with all your might. That's wise counsel. And I love that because what it's telling us is that wisdom is all about walking in a way. It's about acting in a certain way that brings forth life. I mean, wisdom looks like something, guys. It's not just knowledge. It's not just memorizing scripture. It looks like something in the real world. If you go back to that quote, it says, it doesn't matter what you do. This is supposed to be a pithy, wise wisdom saying. It doesn't matter what you do, just do something. Never do what's wrong. Do nothing until it's right. Then do it with all your might. Wisdom is all about action, the right application of knowledge in our lives so that God's life can come to fruition in us and through us. That's the book of Proverbs. So, the question really for us today becomes this. What does wisdom look like? If wisdom looks like something, what does it look like? What should my life look like? What's the rhythm of my life determined by? And that's where we come to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, the text that we're going to be walking through this morning. So if you'd, if you'd just bear with me, if you'd stand to your feet, I'd like for us to read uh, scriptures together as we honor him. Uh, one of the things that I just believe with all my heart that is that our posture and our bodies mean something. You know, C.S. Lewis says that, you know, if you want to be humble before God, then kneel and bow. There's something about physically doing something that brings our heart into alignment with what God is doing. And so this morning we're standing in honor of God's word. So Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, do we have a slide for that? If not, that's okay, I'll just read it. Let it wash over you this morning. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. The word of God for the people of God. Heavenly Father, we just do ask your Holy Spirit to come and reveal truth to us. Lead us this morning into your truth. Dismantle any ways, any understandings in our lives and in our minds before the truth of your word. And may we be wise and not unwise as the days are evil. In Jesus' wonderful name we all said, amen. amen. You can be seated. So what I'd like to do with you this morning is I just want to walk right through the scriptures. I want to take it piece by piece. And it's always important when we read scripture to take note of things like let love and faithfulness never leave you. If the Bible says don't let this ever leave you. I think it's really important to understand what it is we're supposed to hold on to. And scripture here is saying, let love and faithfulness never leave you. The word here translated for love comes from the Hebrew word chesed. And it is a word that is used in scripture to speak about the concrete expression of love. Not just the feeling of love, but the concrete expression of it, what we're doing, how love is coming out of us into our lives. It's actually the same word used of God's covenantal love towards us. The New Interpreter's Bible Dictionary says this, the NRSV uses the expression steadfast love to consistently translate God's chesed. 
The King James Version and other translations use a combination of various terms, including love, mercy, kindness, loving kindness, grace, loyalty, and goodness. The range of connotations for the Hebrew is such that all of these options convey aspects of the concept that the NRSV has hoped to gather up into its choice of steadfast love, chesed. This is the love that God is, the, pro, the author of Proverbs, and God through the author of Proverbs is saying for us to never let go. Never let it go. There are times in our lives that we're going to experience hardship and difficulty. We're going to experience things that we don't understand. And it is essential to the Christian faith to never let go of God's loving, steadfast love in our lives. And it's not just an emotional, ethereal love, a pie in the sky that's out there that doesn't mean anything. It's a love that actually means something in the physical and concrete world. He's doing something in your life today. This steadfast love reflects both the, I love this, uncoercible Uncoerced, nothing can coerce God out of loving you. Nothing. There's no pit deep enough to keep God from you. There's no sea broad enough that God can't reach his loving hand towards you. Uncoercible, consistent, positive, caring attitude of God for Israel and for us and the many faithful acts of God that individually and as a whole give lively expression to that divine care. That's what chesed means. Love and faithfulness. Love and faithfulness. Just hear me this morning. I am speaking over you. Love and faithfulness. I don't know what you're walking through, but God knows, and he is pouring out his love and his faithfulness upon your life. We need to hold to that. We need to hold to that. It's who God is. It's who God is. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 4 through 7, it's the story of Moses and He had broken the first two tablets in anger. And so God's like, hey, you need to to go ahead and fix that. So here it says, Moses chiseled out two stone, and what's that word there? Come on, talk to me. Tablets. Does that sound like anything from the verses we're studying this morning? If we read Proverbs, it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablets of your heart. There is no Israelite who would have sat under the reading of Proverbs and not made this connection, that God wrote the commandments for Israelite, but God wants to write, the, he wants those to be written in our hearts. Go on, it says, like the first ones, and he went up on Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name. Not Moses' name, his, his own name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming. So this is God talking in the third person. And you know what? That's okay. I always hate it when people speak of themselves in the third person. I'm like, what are you doing, bro? Just say me or I. It's okay. But here God's doing it, and I'm like, hands off. God, you're God, and I'm not. And he says, listen, Moses, this is who I am. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. John writes in the New Testament that that God is love. It's his very nature. It's his essence. Why is that important? Because We were created to reflect Jesus and God in the world 
today. The way of wisdom looks like steadfast love and faithfulness. It looks like God the Son washing our feet. It looks like God the Son touching the untouchable leper. It looks like God the Son on the cross. That's who God is. That's who he's revealed himself to be. He's compassionate and slow to anger, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And then scripture moves on. It says, okay, love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. God is wanting us to take love and faithfulness, the essence of who he is, and to write it on the tablet of our hearts. But listen, sometimes because life is hard, sometimes because we get distracted, sometimes because we're distracted by success, sometimes we're distracted by the good things in life. But what ends up happening is those things, they begin to fill our vision and it hardens our heart. It just hardens our heart to God. And sometimes, just, you can just imagine Moses chiseling out the commandments upon the tablets are, uh, that were made of stone. And I'm here to tell you that the world will make your heart harder than that stone. And yet, he's asking us to inscribe upon our heart his steadfast faithfulness and love. And here's why. Because wisdom springs forth from a life lived according to steadfast love and faithfulness. That is the character of our lives as Christians, as sons and daughters of the living God. That's where wisdom springs forth. And I think, honestly, last week, Pastor Ross talked about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and, and I think that's what it means to live with the fear of the Lord. What do I mean? Romans chapter 13, Paul's writing to the church in Rome. Makes sense since the book's called Romans. And here in this verse, he says, clothe yourself, in, chapter, in verse 14, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. I took this class called an, uh, a theology of ordination. And, you know, and really, what does that mean? Ordination is very simply this, that someone is ordained. It's recognized by the, by the body of Christ that they are called to minister as pastors of the church, as leaders of the flock, right? And so what happens is, is other leaders and the church bless this person and ordain them for the work of ministry. And in that class, I learned about how pastors are supposed to embody Christ to the flock. That when you look at me, you don't see Dan Anderson. You see Christ. And I got to tell you, guys, I've been thinking on this for the last couple months. And I've felt the fear of God. Pastor Russ asked me to stand up here and share this message, and I just, I feel the fear of God. I don't want to put my hands on something that's holy. He wants to speak to you. And I just think to myself, I don't want to, I don't want to leave my fingerprints on that. I don't want to try to shape that and make this all about the Dan Anderson ministry. I think what the author of Proverbs was saying to us this morning is that we should live in, fear, in the fear of the Lord, this gracious, compassionate, loving, kindness, and faithful God. Because we are called to reflect God in this world. We were created in the image of steadfast love and faithfulness. What happens when we don't? The world is looking for hope. What happens when his church doesn't look like hope. 
My children are looking at me every day. And I have to ask myself the question, do they see Christ? Do they see this loving kindness and steadfast love? You with me this morning? When I'm tired and frustrated, do my children see Christ? Do my wife, does my wife, as I stand here and deliver the sermon, do you hear the words of God or the words of an insecure preacher trying to win the approval of man? When you and your wife find yourselves in a disagreement, do they see Christ, the embodiment of steadfast love and faithfulness, or do they see anger and hatred? When you find yourself wrong at work, forgotten by friends or family, overwhelmed by the difficulties of life, what do those who are around us see? Church, I believe the Spirit of God is in this room right now. And I believe he's asking you those questions. It's not enough to fill a seat on Sunday morning. It's not enough to proclaim the name of Jesus, but not live in the way of Jesus. And honestly, in the course of the busyness of life, it's easy to forget, isn't it? I mean, you just get, you just, I wake up in the morning, I have a devotional time, sometimes, and the rest of my day, I don't think about God again. And actually, I've experienced this, guys. I get home, and all of a sudden, it's almost like a surprise, like, oh, yeah, God, hey, what is that? What do you think is happening in that in-between space, in that time? See, because here's the thing. In ancient Israel, as in, or even today, Orthodox Jews, they have amulets or necklaces that have sacred writings on them, and they wear that necklace to keep it close to their heart so they don't forget. And then writing it on the tablet of your heart actually means... putting it into the very deepest memory of my being. Because here's the truth. What penetrates to the depths of our heart determines our very character and our actions. Jesus says, out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. What's he saying there? Guys, our heart and our character, what we live in the real world, comes from what's inside here. So, so the author of Proverbs is saying, listen, inscribe on your heart steadfast love and faithfulness. Let it condition and characterize your life. From driving to the way you speak to that rude cashier, Let love and faithfulness characterize your speech and your actions. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't let yourself forget. And I love this. It says, when we can do that, when we can inscribe it upon the tablet of our hearts, keep it near us, allow it to change us, and to produce that fear of the Lord, it says, you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Think about this. I had a friend of mine. His name was Seth Kinnearum in Colorado. The guy was unmovable and unshakable in his good attitude. Sometimes it was really annoying. You ever met someone? They're just like, it's like they're positive, and you're like, listen, bro, I'm just not in the mood. But the thing is, is he wasn't like bubbly and all in your face with it. He was just kind of solid. He was quiet, a solid guy to be around. And there was not a single person in our church that had a bad thing to say about him. 
Why? Because he was the epitome of love and faithfulness. I mean, he just, he was faithful. He served in the church. He never complained. He just loved on people. And he let, he let difficulty kind of fade in the light of God's presence in his life. And he had favor, and he had a good name. It's the natural consequence of allowing love and faithfulness to shape us. So the author here is doing what? He's saying, hey, listen, don't forget. Listen, who wants to live a life of favor and a good name? Yeah, we all do. That's why we have jobs. That's why we're trying to get the next paycheck. We're trying to build up savings. Listen, I get it. We need and want the favor of God on our lives. And when we live like he is, and as he does, we experience that favor. We experience a good name like Seth Kinnear. But here's what, this is, man, Proverbs is so amazing because the next verse says, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And I thought to myself, that's interesting. Why? Why trust? What does trust have to do with inscribing God's love and faithfulness in my heart? What does it have to do with favor and a good name? And here's what I felt like the Holy Spirit just convicted me with, to be honest. The command come for trusting God with all my heart comes after winning favor and a good name because often, if not always, we are tempted after receiving a good name and favor that comes from man, we begin to live for that favor and a good name. We start looking for praise from our friends and our coworkers and our bosses more than we're looking for favor and a good name from God. And listen, this is where the fear of the Lord comes in because when you put your hope in the favor and a good name of man, you begin to fear man. You begin to live in fear of what they say. You begin to fear their judgment. My son is 13. He was sitting in the first service, and I came up to him. And I said, well, what did you learn? Did you, did you learn anything from my sermon? And I'm like, inside, I'm like, please, Lord, please. And he, he looks at me, he goes, honestly, Dad, I just realized, man, I go to school and there's these guys and my friend, they're my friends and they joke like really inappropriately and they cuss and I just go along with it and I don't say anything, but I'm, I'm there and I kind of laugh and joke and he goes, I just realized it's because I'm afraid of them. I'm afraid of their opinions. I'm afraid of what they think, but I need to be more afraid of what God thinks. And I think that's a word for us. I don't want to wash that away like, oh, that's, he's just 13. No, listen, in my 30s and my 40s, and I'm certain in my 50s, I'll still be wrestling with the fear of man. But Lord, help me to inscribe your love and faithfulness on me so I can fear your name and live a life of wisdom that brings forth not just life for me, but life through me to the least lost and lonely of this city. Are you with me this morning? When we put our trust in the favor and a good name of, of, that comes from man, we make favor and a good name our God. God is no longer our God. Favor is our God because we begin to make all our decisions according to that favor. If I can get that favor Don't make favor your God this morning. Lean no, not on your own understanding. This is not about how we understand the world around us. You know, I trust in God with all my heart. I lean not on my own understanding. Listen, it's not about understanding. The key here to understanding this is not about understanding. Because later in Proverbs it says, Listen, if you're going to get, listen, get wisdom. This is wisdom. Get wisdom. And I'm like, okay. And then it says, if it costs all you have, 
get understanding. So it's not understanding. Understanding's not the problem. What's the problem? Two words, your own. We think we know what's best for us. We believe that my knowledge, I know what's good for me and my family. But I'm telling you this morning, the world will deceive you. Your heart will deceive you unless God's love and faithfulness is written upon this heart. What happens, guys, what happens when our understanding of what's good for me and my family bumps up against what God says is good for me and my family? What happens? We stand at a crossroads of trust. Will I trust God over my own understanding? What happens? Giving to God our tithes and offering when we feel the pressure of finances. We stand at a crossroads. Or what about faithfully practicing Sabbath? Taking a day of rest when we're plagued by all that we have to get done. Whose understanding are you leaning on? What about saying no to a better job? and better pay when God is asking us to stay where we are. Often, you know you, know you are being deceived into, belie- into worshiping favor when you think a pay raise is God telling you that it's his voice. But this goes the other way. What happens when you want to stay in your comfortable place, and God's calling you out like Abraham to go. You don't know where you're going, right? He says, come on, Abraham, go to the land that I will show you. Nope, huh? I'm not telling you right now. I'm just going to say, go. How do you even go when you don't know where you're going? Sometimes God's like that. But what happens when you don't have a road map and you don't have all the questions of paycheck and job right, right before you. What happens? You know God's telling you to go. You're standing at a crossroads. What about forgiving and showing steadfast love and faithfulness to someone who has hurt you, to someone who's gossiping about you in the church, and you've got to walk in here every Sunday and see them? Are you going to avoid them, or are you going to show loving kindness and faithfulness to that person? which leads us to, in all your ways, submit to him. That's wisdom, guys. Submit to him. God, I don't understand. It feels like giving away my vehicle to this person in need is a bad idea because I need to get to work. I don't understand. Why are you asking of this? Why are you asking this of me? God, I give it to you. I submit. I submit. And listen, submission is a bad word in our culture. I get it because leaders have abused people with their authority. But God is a God of loving kindness and faithfulness. Your best interests are on his mind. In Proverbs, it says you are the apple of his eye. You can trust him. The foundation of godly submission is not a demeaning of our value. Like, oh, I'm valueless, I just have to submit. No, no, it's actually an expression of your value to put your trust in God because you believe what he said about you. And then finally it says this, the very last part. It says, and he will make your paths straight. Guys, the thing is, is we we spend the majority of our lives attempting to make our own paths straight according to our own understanding, putting our trust in favor and a good name. We use whatever forms of security that most appeal to us or make us feel safe to make straight path for ourselves. Maybe you grew up poor, so you just put so much trust in finances because you're trying to make your path straight. Maybe you, you, your dad left your family when you were a kid and now you're trying, to, you're trying to hold on 
and allow relationships to fulfill that need for a father's love in you. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's the approval. Maybe, maybe your father or your mother didn't give you words of approval, and now you work so hard to get the approval of people. But I'm telling you, that will not make your path straight. In fact, when we do this, listen, this is, I'm coming to the end, guys. We find that the path of our lives range far and wide, twisted and warped, ending up in places we never thought we'd find ourselves. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there, church? You're just at the bottom, and all of a sudden you're like, how did I get here? Doing things that I never thought I would do. How did I get here? I'm going to tell you this morning, church, you got there by trying to make your own path straight. But God is here for you, in you, around you. And he wants to make your paths straight for you. That's not your responsibility. It's God's responsibility. When you trust God, it's his responsibility to make your path straight. You stand at a crossroads. And you have a choice before you. Will you live submitted to God, expressing loving kindness and faithfulness even when it hurts? And allow him to make your path straight. Or will you choose to believe you know best what's for your life? Adam and Eve thought they knew what's best for their lives. And so they disobeyed God. I wonder if they thought that, how did I get here? You know? God wants to make your path straight this morning. Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you do and all that you are in our lives. God, would you just, to every single person, I, God, every single person, in this room, under the sound of my voice, God, would you, they, they may be walking a path that's meandered off yes. into the wilderness, but God, I just, I just pray, would you come and rescue them? God, only you can rescue us. It's, it's only by the name of Jesus can we be saved. God, we need you to come and be the way, the truth, and the life. God, write upon our hearts your love and your faithfulness. And I just pray, God, each person in this room would become a beacon of life, a light upon a hill that cannot be hidden, extending your loving kindness and faithfulness through them to reach the least lost and lonely. And God, I pray you would make their paths straight. Even when we don't understand it, God, we receive your spirit and your truth. Make our paths straight. In Jesus' name, we trust in you, Lord. Amen.